If you're looking for the world's best CBD products, look no further than PalomaVerdeCBD.com, a like-minded business out of San Antonio, Texas, owned by a great couple, Carlos and Vanessa. They love the show. They're supporting the show. They're giving you a discount when you buy these products because you like this show. We'll get there at the end here, but I've been ranting and raving about the sports cream for a long time. It is the best. I genuinely mean that. So if you're sore from workouts, go check out the CBD menthol sports cream. If you're having trouble sleeping, they've got the sleep bundle CBD pack. Maybe you've got pets like I do, like my two French bulldogs, Lux and George, that experience inflammation in some part of their spine or their back legs or whatever. Well, look no further. They've got the pet tinctures and the CBD dog chews over at PalomaVerdeCBD.com. Do you have anxiety at all? Well, there's CBD gummies over there. Are you stressed after a long day? There's CBD bath bombs over there. They've got this new CBD massage oil. Carlos, the owner of, one of the owners of Paloma Verde, keeps asking me if he can use it on me. I've not allowed him to do so yet, but uh, I suspect that their CBD massage oil is quite amazing. So go check that out. All things CBD related, you will find at PalomaVerdeCBD.com. And since they support this show and they want to help the listeners of this show get a discount, I've got a promo code for you. It's Buck, B-U-C-K. Just enter that at checkout. You will get 20% off of your order. That is Buck, B-U-C-K, at checkout over at PalomaVerdeCBD.com. Tell them I sent you and enjoy the products. I know you will. You are now listening to the Counterflow Podcast, a place for dissonant voices and unapproved opinions. You get split in fucking half, cause I call them the hologram graph. But I am the center inside the placenta of math. You clash with cyanide gas and die fast. Rhythmical equivalent of solids, liquid, and gas. We smash a science with the power of Lord Titus. But I am the virus inside of the iris of Cyrus. Here is your host and humble narrator, Buck Johnson. Welcome back once again to the Counterflow Podcast. Great to have you with me here for yet another week of the show where I've got a first time guest on. I've never had Matthew Arrett on before, but I heard him on the great Lou Rockwell's podcast recently, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I started doing my research on him and I said, I need to get this guy on. So lo and behold, here he is with us today. We're going to get into a geopolitical discussion because obviously there's a skirmish going on right now in Ukraine with Russia and Ukraine. But as many of you know, there's there's a lot of other actors on each one of the sides here. And so there's actually more than just two sides, as there often is. And when you pull back and look at things more broadly, some of these same bad actors are lining up with the same people they always do, the alliances and the shadowy backgrounds. And so we're going to get into some of the power structures of the globalists, as we can call them, and what is going on with, obviously, they've had a plan for decades and decades and decades. The term depopulation always comes into play, and we're going to discuss that a little bit today. That's always on the agenda. The, as they say, one world government, that term is certainly thrown about at times. And so we're going to talk about that. Is it just, are there other actors out there that want to fight this system besides us, of course, this small fringe minority of weirdos like us? Are there countries that are fighting against this, what sometimes seems inevitable future towards globalism? So we're going to talk about the players, the powers that be, the power structures. What about Elon Musk? Is he one that we should be uh, cheering for? Is what he's doing something that uh, we should be behind? Is it uh, a move towards freedom and liberty and things like that. What about libertarianism? Is there an inherent flaw in the libertarian philosophy? We're going to get into all kinds of stuff like this, and I'll just bring them right on in. Matthew Arrett is a senior fellow at American University in Moscow, founder of the Canadian Patriot Review and the Rising Tide Foundation, of course, and he's the author of Untold History of Canada series. He's up in Canada, but he's joining us here on Counterflow. Matthew Eric, welcome to the show, man. How are you? Thanks for having me on. I'm good. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I should first thank uh, someone who I consider uh, kind of a hero is Lou Rockwell. I, I was listening to his podcast and that's how I found you. 
And since I've discovered you, uh, you, you do a lot. Um, you have a really cool book series. There's a great sub stack that you are in charge of. You're the founder. Well, hold on. I, I should stop. I'll let you intro yourself. You tell my audience who you are, what you do, and whatever you would like them to know. Yeah, sure, yeah. Um, well, I, as you said, I, I do wear a lot of hats. Um, and uh, and it's uh, amongst those is, uh, uh, I guess the thing that really got me kickstarted was my decision to found a, a Canadian geopolitical and, and history journal back in 2012 called the Canadian Patriot Review, um, which began as a print copy with a website, and now it's purely uh, web-focused. Um more recently, I, I co-founded with my wife, who's a co-author at Strategic Culture with me, um, Cynthia Chung, a, a Montreal-based organization called the Rising Tide Foundation with a bit more of an educational, cultural focus. And um, yeah, re- a senior fellow at the, the American University in Moscow, which is run by Dr. Edward Luzansky, a, uh, uh, he's a, 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 you know, an anti-Soviet uh, activist, a, a defector from Russia um, back in the late 70s, who uh, founded uh, this is a think tank educational uh, outlet that also has hosted hundreds and hundreds of con- uh, conferences since the 1990s to try to promote U.S.-Russia friendship, and especially um, after 2005, 2006, when it became more clear that there was a a neocon agenda to uh, try to encircle Russia with missile with a missile shield, which is currently still obviously at the heart of a lot of our our global problems. The, the purpose of his conferences became increasingly focused towards war avoidance um, based upon an idea of cultural and economic exchange and collaboration. Um, and yeah, I've most, I guess the last thing I'll say is I, I recently finished the third volume of uh, the Untold History, no, sorry, of the Clash of the Two Americas trilogy. Um, the, the previous four volume book series that I'd, I'd written was called The Untold History of Canada, sort of to int- re- uh, evaluate all of Canadian history from 1774 until the present from the standpoint of uh, the recognition that there is an oligarchy. Um, we don't have a sovereign nation and that uh, this oligarchy, which is based in the city of London, is both the enemy of the United States, both today as it has been since uh, the U.S. broke free, kind of, in 1776, whereas there has been a fifth column a, a British controlled fifth column inside of the heart of the USA since the very beginning that never there, there's a direct continuity. So using that picture, I tried to reconstruct, well, what the hell is Canada within that broader equation as the only monarchy of the Americas. And that evolved more recently into the three volume clash of the two Americas. That's, that's out on my website too. We hear a lot about uh, one world government and that, that that's the goal of some of these nefarious actors behind the scenes. Are we headed that way, or do you see it as there's there's some factions that aren't necessarily willing to fit under the same umbrella? Yeah. Oh, for sure. No, there's factions. I mean, the the, the clearest point, uh, I think, the, the solace, clearest, simple point that there are factions, and this is not a done deal, is that they haven't won. <laughs> you know, it's not like they just woke up, you know, four years ago and said, okay, now we want a one world government. Mm-hmm. This is, you know... It has different names, you know. New World Order was, I think, the uh, the term used by by Kissinger, George Bush Senior, back in 1992 with the collapse of the Soviet Union. They started using that term a lot. Biden actually yeah. just wrote an article saying how I came to learn to love the New World Order back in 1992. Um, fun article, sick. Uh, and that's when he still had a partial a partial brain intact. Um, <laughs> so th- there has been an ongoing continuity for a long time, and so it's not like Again, it just came out of nowhere. Uh, if they had all of the their pawns in place and controlled ev- every element on the global stage, they already would have won. Mm-hmm. So the fact that they have still found resistance, the fact that they haven't been able to achieve what they've desired for decades, indicates very clearly as a first step that there is resistance both within the United States as well as within other countries, but especially within Eurasia, um, which is where I've seen the greatest uh, utilization of the power of the sovereign nation state system, which is really at the heart of the the idea of one world government is the destruction of the institution of the sovereign nation state as a modern phenomenon. It didn't exist before the Renaissance. It really only took on a a potent life as a representative type of institution after the American Revolution. Um, People take that for granted. And as a Canadian, we all take that for granted. Canadians are not allowed to appreciate the, the world historic 
significance of 1776 because we still have a monarchy that's our head of state, right? Controlling mm-hmm. our history books, controlling how we think and look, look and feel at the, wor- at the world, especially at our southern cousins. So anyway, um, yeah, I do see that there is a resistance. And ironically, that it, it, it's, in, it's in parts of the world which appear on the surface to be the most anti-American country, like parts of the world you can imagine, Russia, mm-hmm. Asia, China, India, like it seems super the most opposite of the United States you could, you could get. But when you look at what they're doing, as far as like design, purpose, intent, practical action, as far as they're wielding the power of government in opposition to this globally extended empire that's been trying to reduce the world population and dumb us down under a, and I mean, that's the key thing, right? The, the idea of the, of this new world order, this one world government idea is to reduce, is to have a power to reduce the world population, to stupidify us to a state of uh, well-behaved cows that are the ones that are permitted to survive, that have the good behavior. Um, And with that, have no industrial base to support either energy policy, food policy, industrial policy. None of that can exist in any type of significant power that allows for the sustenance of seven, eight, nine billion people. It has to go down to something, something far less. So Russia and China and India and a few others, Iran, and more, others are getting on board with the idea that they don't want to commit mass suicide. They've, they've increasingly created an alternative uh, system. And I'm hoping that, I mean, this is what gives me a certain sense of hope, is that that battle that is currently underway can provide patriots in the transatlantic zone where there's much more Five Eyes NATO control, a power to navigate with and cohere to that allows us to do battle properly with this globally extended empire centered in London. Um, yeah. Do you think what what's going on right now between Russia and Ukraine, and we, we can say Russia and Ukraine, NATO, the U.S., and some other forces like that, is this is that kind of a microcosm of of the picture you're, you've just painted? Yes, most certainly. Um, Na- I mean, what's going on in Ukraine is the consequence of the inability to resolve World War II. You could just say it that way. I, I, I found it very useful, especially now that it's a Victory Day this week. You know. And it's ironic, you know, you, you look at the, the, the video footage from Russia, all over Russia, you've got endless oceans of people holding pictures of their family members who died fighting the fascist machine in World War II. Um, I'm here in Canada, where back in the 80s and the 90s, we used to celebrate this. And there wasn't a single parade, there was no activity to, to bring about any type of recollection or appreciation for that fight that had occurred that mm. stopped a one world fascist government from happening back in the 1930s and 40s. Um, And I think a big part of that has to do with the fact that, you know, you have, like at the United Nations, there was a vote recently to uh, prevent, to, to, to ban the, uh, the celebration of Nazi uh, war criminals today. And you think that's a no brainer. Of course, every nation would want to vote that one up. That's, that seems like a, a stupid thing to even like have to vote on, except all of Europe abstained from voting. And the two nations of the world that actually voted no was Ukraine and the United States. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, you wonder why. Well, it's because there's been a lot of effort, I would say seven decades worth of effort to keep a certain romantic mythology alive in the minds of a lot of the the Ukrainian uh, people, especially the expats that were, uh, that had left Ukraine in the 50s, 60s, 40s even, um, many of whom had been Nazi collaborators around the Stefan Bandera network. There's a huge, I mean, there's a joke going around that uh, don't ask a woman her age or a, or a Ukrainian what the grandpa was doing in World War II. Mm. Uh, <laughs> and there was a huge uh, Nazi collaborating phenomenon um, with Nikola Lebed, uh, Stefan Bandera, um, leading figures who were hyper ethno nationalist from a genocidal standpoint. It's not even that they wanted just a, a pure braced Ukraine, but they actually went out of their way to kill. S- thousands, hundreds of thousands of Slavs, of Poles, of Jews, of Gypsies, uh, Roma people, all throughout the 1940s in collaboration with uh, Hitler. And after World War II, were they punished in Nuremberg? Um, hells no. No, they were, they were absolved of their sins. Mikola Lebed was absorbed into the CIA, where he ran it for 60 or 50 years afterwards, um, a CIA front group called Pro. Uh, uh, oh, I'm forgetting the name. Anyway, he ran a front group uh, offering consultation for the CIA and uh, was paid taxpayer money through the CIA to reconstruct a, a narrative 
um, for future generations of Ukrainians around the idea that the real bad guy of World War II was Russia and not Germany, yeah. um, which has really come alive um, since the Soviet Union collapsed. And increasingly, now we've had now three decades of children being processed in Ukraine through, uh, you know, Pravi sector, Svoboda managed uh, summer camps for kid, you know, for kids. Treat, you know, train these kids to look at again people like Le- like Lebed, like uh, Stefan Bandera, who again was absorbed by Alan Dulles and brought into West German intelligence along with Hitler's entire uh, intelligence apparatus around Reinhard Gelling, who was mm-hmm. put in charge of of West German intelligence throughout the entirety of the the, the beginning first twenty years of the Cold War. Um. So these were people, again, who were absorbed into Anglo-American intelligence, both inside of the USA, some in South America, many in Ukraine, many in Germany, and are still today celebrated as national heroes. Um, So yeah, I I think very much you have what's going on in Ukraine on so many levels, both the economic warfare. I mean, Ukraine was subjected to what they want to do to the world in terms of a 30-year period of economic destruction Mm -hmm. that radicalized the people, created an atmosphere of despair. Took, you know, Ukraine back in 80, 88, 89 was the economically most powerful country per, GD, per capita, GDP, and reduced down to squalor in, in what we have today. They have a bioterror apparatus as well <laughs> that's been part of the global equation for mass population control is, is biolabs, bioterror run by the Pentagon. That's increasingly become something that people have been thinking about. That's There's a big operation inside of Ukraine and in Georgia and in South Korea for that. Um, yeah, and it's part of the missile shield. So part of the idea of a global first strike power by the by the military industrial complex um, of the USA and, and you know some other powers in Europe. Um, that's what's underlying this whole circle Russia, circle China with a missile shield, so that you could take out their ability to respond to a strike and thus reduce them to a state of uh, a slave colony mm-hmm. for the uh, the banking elite in the West. So that's another aspect. So yeah, again, to answer your question in short, absolutely. Ukraine is a microcosm. Did did Trump throw a monkey wrench? Are they, are, let me ask you this way. Are these plans that were kind of on the table already? And had Hillary been the president of the United States, they might this some of these things might have happened sooner. Did Trump throw a monkey wrench into this system? What are your thoughts on, on his his term? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. They no one's gonna convince me that they did not want Hillary in in 2016. They wanted Hillary in. Absolutely. Um and yeah, I think that uh, a lot of us, a lot of the opportunities we have to um, make changes to speak the truth today um, would not be here had Hillary been running roughshod, doing the Biden program four years earlier uh, than we've had it. Um, no, we'd be much more advanced in our in our uh, process of decay into a dark age and possibly even already at a, at a nuclear war because these people mm. running the or managing uh, the, the, the technocrats that represent Obama, you know, the whole Hillary campaign and Biden, they, they are ideologically committed to doing everything possible to achieve their new world order script, which they've been following for many decades. And that script does not include the coexistence or the, the existence of a sovereign China, sovereign India, sovereign Russia. That's not part of it. These, co- these countries are supposed to be balkanized, chalked up into little micro-ethnic ethnic mini-states, all subservient under a divided-to-conquer structure of empire uh, to the IMF, the World Bank, and other globalist institutions that will be brought online to manage the world's uh, population under, a, under a, 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 a culling of the herd. So Russia and China are, are willing to go to the ends of the earth to defend their ancient civilizations to the point mm-hmm. of even... Uh, hard, hot war, if needed. I mean, if they're really, if it's an existential threat, Putin said it directly just a couple of weeks or even a week ago that if it's an existential threat, unfortunately, the, the nuclear uh, weapons will be used. Um, they don't want to, and they will do everything possible to avoid that. But with that in mind, um, no, I think they would have prob- probably been party put up to the wall several times over, and we probably would be dead had Hillary been in. So mm. for Trump, yeah, when you look at what he did, over the course of the four years, I know a lot of people are uh, are increasingly black pilled, you know, because he he has blind spots. He's not like a John F. Kennedy, but you know, um, and bad things have been have happened after Trump was in power. Bad things happened, um, but the logic a lot of people who had formerly supported Trump are increasingly uh, saying now they're all demoralized, they're all afraid, 
and they're blaming the bad things that are happening now for the for the fight that he was waging and saying that, oh, he was just part of the controlled opposition in that sense. Yeah. Right. I'm getting a lot of that. And I think that it, it, it negates the actual uh, facts, the, the fight itself as it happened for that four year period where he pulled out. I mean, I, I, I followed it very closely. I, I documented it in my writings constantly. So, I mean, I, I had this um, a sense of the fight pretty well um, from the standpoint of his first act of shutting down the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Yeah. Like, why did he do that, right? Um, which was the NAFTA of the Pacific. Why did he bring back, why did he break the, the all of the rules of the, of the World Trade Organization by bringing back, bringing back national protectionism, the right of a nation to utilize protectionist policies, which goes against every law of the World Trade Organization? It's fundamentally American. Why did he do that? Why did he, uh, you know, recalibrate the U.S. military to cooperate with the, with the Russian military in Syria and implicitly the Syrian military as well? Why did he do that? Why did he, um, why did he uh, make a serious commitment to pull the U.S. out of the World Health Organization to stop funding that? Um, you know, there's so many to, to break the U.S. out of its NATO commitments. Why did he do that? Why did he cut off all funding to the National Endowment for Democracy, which is just a mm-hmm. CIA front regime change right. operation in Hong Kong, Ukraine, everywhere else, Xinjiang? He did that. Why? You know, um, and it's not like. He, th- his enemies went along with it. They did everything possible to impeach him, disrupt him, to call him a Russian stooge, to, I mean, I think he probably survived a few assassination attempts that we don't even know about. But it's not like people, his enemies, the, the enemies of the world were not working very hard to destroy him during that entire time. So you can't, you can't pretend that that didn't happen. But that's what people tend to do because they, you know, again, blackpilled. I got to tell you about the wildest, weirdest, coolest, most funny sponsors I have. It's kind of like a two-in-one. It's the Liberty Tree podcast and the Liberty Tree clothing line, which I absolutely love. We're going to talk about that in a second. As for this podcast, can you beat this description? It's kind of like if Shane McGowan did Man on the Street interviews in rural Northern California, and after that content was picked up by CNN, it was then analyzed on Sunday mornings by really intelligent, albeit half in the bag, but nonetheless, good-looking construction workers. There you go. How about that? What they love, liberty, free speech, Western culture, family, breakfast beers, guns, training to kill with their bare hands, and like myself, really, really bad jokes. What they are not, statists, progressives, and, well, funny. A few highlights from their podcast include episode five, where they teach the principles of free driving and talk about how it might just save the world. Most of their predictions have come true. The one they are still tracking and updating regularly is Justin Trudeau's apparent transition. Episode 16 comes out of the gate with really strong joke about a deer that anyone can memorize and use at a party. See there? Thank you for your service. Much like this show, episodes come out every Tuesday with bonus episodes and interviews mixed in here and there. As for this clothing line that I was mentioning earlier, I love it. It's the Liberty Tree lifestyle. They are subversive fashions for free thinkers and lovers of liberty. Now, as for the websites, and of course, you get a discount code. Wait till you hear about this discount code too. The apparel site is libertytreelifestyle.com. And that's where I got the uh, old world order shirt that I have. I've had several people comment on that. Well, you know where you can get it? You can get it over at LibertyTreeLifestyle.com. Their podcast is at LibertyTreePodcast.org. That is LibertyTreePodcast.org. And I told you I've got a promo code. Back to, uh, well, what these guys aren't is funny. (laughs) Check out the promo code. It will get you 10% off. Counterflow with Buck Johnson. All one word counterflow with buck johnson will get you 10 percent off of your order go over to libertytreelifestyle.com and libertytreepodcast.org tell them i sent you and get some of those cool shirts over there at libertytreelifestyle.com let's get back to the show it yeah. seemed when when he was president i was specifically towards the end of his term here i saw what i would call like an awakening uh, for a lot of maybe boomer conservatives across the United States. There's many that I know personally are watching, reading, 
uh, content now and, and reporting back to me with questions and that never, ever, absolutely would not have been into some of these things that they're into, probably some material like your own uh, prior to Trump's presidency. Did you see a similar thing across Canada during that time? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I stopped writing. Um, uh, like I shut down my Canadian Patriot between 2014 and 2016. I just shut it down because frankly, I was like, there's not a lot of reception. People don't really seem to care about this, this, uh, way of looking or analyzing, um, the mm -hmm. situation that I was providing. And, uh, I focused on other things. And then with Trump, yeah, there was such, I, I looked one day on my, my Canadian Patriot website, the dashboard just to, I kept it going, you know, but I had a look and I was like, holy sh, you know, after a couple of months he was in there, I looked, I looked at my website. I was like, Hmm, it's exploding. My website is exploding and I haven't even tried to do anything with it. Uh, so there was an, a total hunger because people had a sense for the first time that this uh, New World Order script, again, had resistance. It wasn't as advanced or as consolidated as people had thought it was, which had caused a lot of people, I think, to just check off in demoralization, thinking, okay, you know, n a lot of people had discovered, you know, 9-11 was not what we were told by the uh, the official narrative, that there was a uh, banker's conspiracy. Like, these are very common things that people had thought about. And it's like, at a certain point, if it's that controlled, what the hell's the point in me trying to like stress myself out looking at this even more and being reminded of my impotence, which is sort of the feeling a lot of people went through. I went through that too. Um, at a certain point, you're like, I can't handle it. I just got to focus on my immediate surroundings, you know, and, and just be functional. And then all of a sudden, yeah, you, you saw the, the Hillary thing get derailed. And there was evidence that there was a fight, a bigger fight in the US that I had thought had fallen personally. Um, and it, you it definitely, it was polarizing across Canada. I mean, a lot of people, especially on the West Coast, further removed from the uh, the more controlled zones of uh, Montreal and Toronto, which are a little bit more of like a New York type of... Con the, co the cosmopolitan zones are usually a little bit more psycho-spiritually uh, aid. <laughs> Whereas when you go to the more blue-collar farming, like productive areas, people are not so messed up by... Um, a poisonous imperial culture or, or fake knowledge, you know, they actually have real world skills. So you can think a little bit more with their, their common sense. So anyway, there was a big explosion of, of hope. And, uh, yeah, I, I don't think that the current development of, of even the freedom convoy that had happened in February, mm -hmm. that would not have been a possible phenomenon had there not have been four years of fight going inside of the USA, which are still going on to this very day. I interface with a lot of these better, better Republican networks, like the not neocon Republicans. Uh, that yeah. represent, I think, the only viable faction of the U.S. If the U.S. is going to survive the coming storm, it's going to be because of something within that <laughs> that legitimate component of the Republican base. Uh, nothing, nothing else that I see is viable. What did the whole, uh, we'll call it COOF uh, moment, how did that play into this, the COVID? How, how did that, what happened with that, what, we, what came of that? What, what part did all of that play in this, in this bigger picture? Well, yeah, this is something which I wasn't looking at. I, I think a lot of people, I, I think Alex Jones was looking at it. Um, he was probably one of the few early on, uh, but I wasn't. And I, I didn't really pay attention to bio warfare as, as a very serious part of my thinking. Um, in hindsight, probably should have. And, you know, and just like a lot of other people I've uh, discovered in, in doing my research, and I've written about this, it's a big part of my new book, that uh, going back even to before 9-11, there were two different mm -hmm. scenarios, not just planes and buildings. There was another scenario being, being toyed around with uh, that expressed itself in a, in a series of war games uh, or, or pandemic games uh, called Dark Winter, overseen by, by Fauci, um, was the idea of a weaponized smallpox scenario being deployed from Saddam Hussein's Iraq into the United States and how the U.S. was going to uh, respond militarily to Iraq. And this is back in 2000, uh, before 9-11. And at the same time as that was happening, you also had, you know, the, uh, these other war games being deployed with NORAD and other things on, like, what would the U.S. do if, uh, let's say, somebody in a cave took over planes and, and launched them into buildings, you know, and how would we respond by invading their countries and <laughs> and restoring order uh, to the U.S. So that was that was already out there, and they chose the planes instead. But the the um, the bio warfare component um, didn't disappear. In fact, after nine eleven, within seven days, you had the beginning of the the two month long anthrax attack 
inside job again. I'm, I'm just saying that, but it's true. It's provable that this, there was a, a low level guy at Fort Detrick who was thrown under the bus, but, um, but that was an inside job that killed a few people in America, you know, letters being sent to a variety of, of state officials and, and, and federal officials. But what came out of that was the policy of uh, BioShield, the BioShield Act, co-authored by uh, Cheney and Victoria Newland, his assistant, who was also going on to, to be the U.S. rep for NATO. And that was, um, that was basically what amounts to a $50 billion uh, black budget, op- not even black budget, that was official budget operation from taxpayer money that was built up to maintain and grow a, a nefarious um, global bio lab uh, infrastructure, including all sorts of uh, research on weaponizing a whole variety of things, <laughs> various pathog- pathogens, reviving the plague, um, genetically modifying um, mosquitoes, other forms of bugs that could be used as vectors to deploy against uh, target populations using ethnic targeting. So you can sort of modify certain pathogens in ways I don't fully understand, but they write about it, um, to target population, um, enemy populations. I think China and Russia have been looking, not I think, I know that they've been looking at this with great trepidation for many years, especially since this bioweapons thing really grew and blossomed under Obama, who uh, with Senator Lugar founded a variety of these things in Georgia, which is to this very day, not only a target to be absorbed by NATO, but also a bioweapons hub. Um, and also South, South Korea, which is another U.S. military colony, which hosts a, a wide array of bio labs using a lot of this research, which the Chinese have been very scared of, have been speaking out about for a long time, and that the Western media does not talk about at all. So all of this to say, um, you had a series of pandemics, you know, with, I mean, the Rockefeller Foundation funded lockstep uh, program in 2011 or 10. Then you had, you had a variety in 2016, 17, again, always overseen by Fauci as a, as a cardboard cutout manager of this thing. And then the big one was uh, that everyone knows about was Event 201. And it disrupted a lot. I mean, it was a, a, a global game changer, obviously, on a variety of levels. It disrupted the, the three-year effort that Trump had made to create a positive new set of relationships with, with, between the USA and, and China, especially on economic collaboration. That was disrupted big time. Um, and uh, I don't think I need to go through details. People have lived it for the last two mm-hmm. years. Um, but yeah, it's, it's both a psyop, but it's a, it's an economic, it's, it's a means of maintaining control during a time of economic collapse. And that collapse was going to happen with or without a pandemic. It just so happens that in order to maintain control of the system that while it's, while it's financially blown out, because the whole financial system is a giant bubble, it's become a weapon, like it's become a time bomb. And that time bomb, it, they, the oligarchy has created this time bomb of a giant speculative bubble that was once our economy in order to have a controlled demolition of that, that bomb. And I think they know, or they knew that, especially under Trump, that the likelihood of the U.S. and many other European countries to jump on board the only other viable system which floats in the water at this point, which is Eurasia, was very high. So they had to disrupt that in every way possible and keep top-down controls as much as humanly possible or inhumanly possible, since <laughs> these guys don't behave <laughs> like humans, um, onto the system that they want to manage. So, Just in, in that answer that you gave, you mentioned two things that, that were kind of separate but have now, it seems like, come back around to joining uh, Victoria Newland and, and bioweapons uh, labs. Yeah. I, at first, they were reported to be in Ukraine, I believe even Putin was talking about them, and then it was quick. The press jumped on it quick. That's a conspiracy theory. That, but I believe did she not admit in Cong- under some kind of uh, testimony that there indeed was? Is that right? Yeah, and in uh, in the Senate, there was a Senate committee hearing, and uh, she did she did uh, <laughs> admit. And you know, it's funny that I I had uh, my wife and I had an interview that we conducted with a bio warfare expert um, a week before. Um, just on this very issue, there's, there had been enough media and research that had been produced to talk about this. And, and we had this person on and I wanted to do a little bit of research to inform myself before the interview. And uh, every page after page of Google searches of bio labs, bioweapon, Ukraine, all just resulted with fact checkers saying this was a conspiracy. There is no evidence of this. And I was like, damn, this, I really thought there was more to it. And I, I knew there was, but I mean, the, the amount of effort, you know, there, there's that Shakespeare quote, me thinks that death protest too much. Um, and, uh, and sure enough, yeah, within just a few days, it went from conspiracy theory to fact. 
um, with her admission and not just with her admission. I mean, the, there was a, a bounty of information that had uh, been pulled together um, even before she said that, but people were taking it more seriously from Diliana. Oh, I forgot her name now. Diliana, a Bulgarian researcher who did incredibly good work on it. Anyway, but there, there is a lot of research that had already been done, which was then brought back into focus. And the Russian um, government made announcements that they had acquired a variety of very interesting hard evidence that they tried to bring to the UN Security Council um, from Ukraine. You know, there were several bio labs that they were able to take back control of. And while a lot of the the material, the pathogens were uh, flushed, were burnt and destroyed as far as getting rid of evidence is concerned, there was still a paper trail on a, from a variety of sources that they were able to, to commandeer in warehouses and other things in the basement of a couple of these, these facilities that when they tried to bring it to the United Nations Security Council, except for China, every other member basically stuck their fingers in their ear, went la 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 la, and uh, refused to even hear what the evidence was. And our, our complicit media just was sure to just turn off their cameras to not even cover it. But uh, yeah, yeah, there's, there's a serious reality that is pushing <laughs> against the narrative here, um, which indicates there is a, a very vast bioweapons complex. I think the Canadian uh, Ked Dieu, I just started looking at him and, and his story, but it seems like he's also playing a pretty big role who's apparently, you know, he tried to get out of, he's the character who tried to climb out of a sewer at the uh, Azovstal steel plant uh, about a week ago and was captured by uh, Russian soldiers. And he's been held in captivity by Russia. Um, he's a Canadian. The Canadian government is trying to separate themselves from from him by throwing out a bunch of stories about him being a, uh, a sex offender, which might very well be true. Um, but they're trying to really separate themselves from having any responsibility over him. Although he has a bio, he has a big bio warfare background. He apparently was a, a director of one of the key facilities under, uh, I think it was 17 employees in Ukraine. So that's another, another thing that's just waiting to have a broader light cast upon some of that material as well. So we don't know as of yet, uh, what some of those bioweapons labs were, were, uh, <laughs> concocting, uh, for lack of a better term. We do, um, but I don't know the degree to which the evidence has been released publicly by the Russians at this point. Uh, a lot of the, the the material that I've seen that I've seen so far is not verified the way I'd like it to be. So I'm going to okay. hold back and just wait sure. a little bit until some of that material comes out. Another name that has been popping up quite a bit. I I, I try to remain skeptical all of the time, uh, and so when Elon Musk. Uh, was making waves and offered to buy Twitter and then ended up uh, buying Twitter. There was, of course, excitement on the right and, and kind of by liberty types. Oh my God, finally we're saved. I'm still skeptical. Uh, I don't know what he represents other than a lot of money and the richest person uh, on the planet from what I can tell. But it does seem like a lot of the people that I don't like are really, really upset that he's making these waves. What What is his role in some of this? What does he represent to you? In my assessments, um, I think that he is a, a controlled opposition. Um, I, I, think, I think of him when I look at his bio, his history, uh, you know, just, a, just a, what role he plays in a broader chemistry. Um, there's a lot of red alarms, obviously. His, his uh, very creepy, fanatical belief in... Uh, merging human beings and machines in order to keep mm -hmm. humanity relevant as part of this new neo, neo darwinian uh philosophy right this transhumanist idea that if we don't merge with machines and genetically modify ourselves with crispr and merge microchips into our brains we're going to be made irrelevant by the growth of ai that's how the that's how the formula is 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 created right so either we will be made irrelevant and we should just accept that we will upload our, we will be able to, um, this is actually a belief of, or one of the beliefs of, of the oligarchy is, uh, is the idea of achieving immortality, that we can cheat death finally by eventually being able to download our, uh, our essence in, by, into binary computer codes and then upload it into a cloud and thus overcome the, uh, and we're not talking about heaven clouds here, we're talking about uh, the cloud, the Google clouds. Mm -hmm. um, or maybe sort of a cyborg that could completely just, you know, transplant your, your soul, your binary, um, 
digitalized soul by USB from like one machine to another every few thousand years or something, you know? Um, so that's actually a fanatical belief at the, at, the, at the upper echelons, which is creepy and weird. But um, the other one is that, you know, maybe we can avoid that fate by just simply merging with machines and keeping a little bit of our, our, our or, organic component, you know, but overall still, still ultimately cheating death, which is, I think, part of the, the underlying psychology of, of oligarchism as an ism, as a sickness, is this inability to confront the reality of our, our, of our mortality. So that's, that's, I think, something to keep in mind when you're like thinking about the, like, how do I get into the mind of one of these sick, yeah, SOBs, right? Part mm -hmm. of it is that you have to appreciate that they're deaf, they're totally afraid, they're in, they have no ability to think about the existence of their soul. They can't think about it. <laughs> they can't think about how that soul is related to a higher uh, cosmic causal structure. They can't think about that. Thus, they're perpetually addicted to this idea that their identity is entirely based in the sensual component of themselves. And prolonging that as long as possible becomes the purpose of their existence. Um, and, and, and it maintains a certain mission orientation across many generations, which is a really sad way to have a mission orientation. But anyway, and to, and why condemn your kids and grandkids to that type of identity? It's, it's sick. Anyway, Elon Musk definitely is, is contaminated with that. His um, choice in wife, as far as a woman who's deeply into the occult, satanic mm -hmm. witchcraft is is also questionable. Like that says something about your character. If that's the type of person you want to have as your mate, um, that's, you know, doesn't mean you're bad, but I mean, it means you got some seriously uh, defunct wisdom <laughs> and uh, there's that component. And then there's the aspect of like, well, okay. Um, is there evidence that he's really this genius? I mean, I know everyone says he's a genius. That's what I'm supposed to believe. But then if I actually listen to him speak about like why he thinks what he thinks about like us going to space and I'm, I'm for space. I love space exploration. It gets me excited. I think it's, I think it's ultimately our destiny to be a creature of the, a, a species of the galaxy and, and beyond, you know, I think that that's ultimately in our cards. But he cannot put his motives into words in any meaningful way. It's just like, I want to because I think it's cool. I think we should. I think that, you know, there's just no passion. There's, he doesn't speak like a human. He speaks like it's a synthetic set of words. Um, and then there's his association with things like, you know, Bill Gates's giving pledge. You know, this whole, like, he's one of the, the top uh, billionaires, the top 10 billionaires on the giving pledge with Bill Gates, Michael Bloomberg, uh, Ward Buffett, who have pledged to give half of their wealth to uh, philanthrop philanthropic causes, which if you look at the philanthropic causes, they're usually things that undermine nation states under the uh, mm -hmm. veneer of virtue, but actually are designed to kill anyway. Um, so he's, he, he's got a bunch of things like that. And then the, the last thing I would say is, okay, I'm not against rich people because I, I think that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pro-capitalist. I think that you should be able to, uh, you know, be an excellent, brilliant person committed to a good work ethic and, and creativity and share it and create a, uh, an, you know, a good economic um, boost for, the, for your nation and, and make some money while you're doing it. That's great. A lot of good, good rich people are out there. Um, even being a, a rich person in a, in a super corrupt evil system doesn't mean that you're corrupt or evil. You could have done things differently, right? There's examples of that too. But to be the richest person <laughs> in that mm. satanic system uh, I don't think you can honestly earn the type of hundreds of billions of dollars of, 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 uh, <laughs> that are associated with Elon Musk within a system wired the way it is in such an evil way. I don't think that that can be just honestly done. And he doesn't seem to exhibit the care, the, 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 the necessary competence level on any level to be able to have done that. Um, so all that to say, I think he's a Trojan horse. I think his, his purpose has been to promote an idea, an, an an economic model of scientific and technological investments, which are intrinsically going to fail. Because as soon as you, 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 if you try to like get the nation state, the sovereign nation state out of the equation of how do you have a viable space policy, like a real, if you wanted to have a, let's say you really wanted to develop a, a lunar colony and a Mars colony and, and develop the, an exploration system of the moons of Jupiter and Mars, Right, or, and, and, and Saturn and beyond, right? Let's say we had that multi-generational policy, the way JFK was putting it into motion. Um, without the sovereign nation state, if you're just doing it for like billionaires, for venture capitalists, um, for profit, it, it's not going to work. It's like trying to go into surgery uh, with a, a, a McDonald's plastic fork and knife. Like the surgery might be possible and necessary, but if you think that you have to use the plastic knife and fork, you will self-sabotage. And I think that that's what his model is designed to do. It's like designed to channel a lot of people's 
necessary optimism in science and then create uh, tools that will not make it happen um, mm. and only demoralize the cause, undermine the cause of, of leaping across or beyond our limits to growth, which is what scientific and technological progress should be. It should bring us into more communion with God's mm. creation by discovering the lawmaker's laws, right? And then uh, working with those laws willfully that harmonizes human beings with God's creation in the universe, which is the universe, um, and finding more of ourselves while we're doing that. That that will the act of doing that allows us to do what no other animal can do. Other animals just adapt to their ecology. We can transcend those limits when we act this way, mm-hmm. and uh, and and when we are demoralized by failure, uh, well, we we choose to instead go inward, and we then say, okay, well, we were foolish for thinking we could go beyond our limits, and that benefits only the oligarchy who's been trying to get us to think like animals for a long time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When you do digging into the, these topics that we're talking about, and, and in fact, you just mentioned it even with Elon's wife, uh, with the elite and the oligarchs and these people with that are kind of hidden in the shadows of power, the occult always comes up. Two, uh, two things I've noticed, depopulation yeah. and occultism yeah, always come up. Yeah, uh, And, and I, I, I was at a, a talk, a speaking engagement last weekend, and we, uh, my friend uh, and I mentioned that uh, we believe that there are evil spirits about and, and at play when, when it comes to topics like these. And I kind of took some people off guard, like evil spirits? What do you mm-hmm. No, not for real evil spirits. Do you see some of this as, as a larger battle than just the stuff we see in the material world, uh, like a, an actual uh, old good versus evil battle? Well, I, I think that when you get into the inner echelons of, of these power structures, there is a deep seated belief in, uh, Satanism in uh, a whole, it's, it, it goes beyond logic. Like there is, um, a religious like, um, inner oligarchical culture to, um, which essentially makes the sacred unsacred and that which is the most unsacred, the most perverse becomes sacred. So the very opposite of what our natural um, souls yearn for, which is the good, the beautiful, the true, that's like, every, that's the, the key to wisdom, right? Is the yearning for and the working towards um, that which is true and good and beautiful, which is embedded in the entirety of, of the cosmos. So that usually causes people to get better, their worlds to get better, their families to get better, right? Everything gets better to the degree that that is the orientation. That's what the American founding fathers were all about when they, when they chose the words in order to form a more perfect union. It was, the, it was a very self-perfectible idea, right? It could always be made better, but it had the seeds of its own renewal, its own self-perfectibility embedded within its constitutional systems. Um, it was not a finished product and it was never supposed to be a finished product because as soon as you finish a product, it, it implies that you know, you cannot get any better. That that right there is a big limitation on both ourselves and God. If you assume that the universe is just this finished thing, right? Um, so the oligarchy can always be made worse to a certain degree. And there's a guy named uh, Theodore Adorno, who's a big Frankfurt yeah. School philosopher. Um, you heard about him, eh? Mm. Okay. Yeah, he's a he's a big influence in the uh, the aesthetical education of society, especially after World War II in the critical race theory universe, but also as, apl- as it applied to arts and science. And in, the, in music, he's a musicologist. He was of the view that um, necrophilia is the last organic phase of style. So in his world, everything should naturally decay to the point of um, necrophilia. And, and you can't really go beyond necrophilia. It, when, you're, when that becomes like the norm, <laughs> you've lost it. Like there's nothing left that's human to rekindle uh, any type of redemption, <laughs> if that's the case. So there is, I think, a bottom limit to, uh, to the perversion. You, you can't, you know. But I'll have to say, yeah, they, they do have a Masonic type of tradition that's been co- continuous since the days of ancient Babylon. Um, before the words Satan were around, they had other names for the thing. Marduk was a big uh, deity that was an archetype for later on Zeus or Apollo later in its later manifestations. Earlier on in Babylon, it was Marduk. And they had a whole cult-like priesthood, sacrificial functions, not just animals, but also humans, often children. Um, a lot of castration was, were part of these ritual rituals as well mm. for the, 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 priest, the priest class who was supposed to, um, to be a priest of a lot of these, these organizations, these cults, including the cults in Rome, um, like Sibyl 
which is an Earth Mother Gaia cult in uh, the Roman Imperium, uh, to be one of the priests, the holy men, you had to literally castrate yourself to purify yourself of the world of binary uh, sex and impulses, right? Mm-hmm. And to, to make yourself pure. Now... Sounds familiar. <laughs> exactly. They're doing that yeah. again. Yeah. Well, exactly. That, that's part of the thing today. Yeah, it, it's, it's a shame-based guilt thing that hu- being human beings are just so bad uh, that people are induced to just cut off their, their male or, fi- or feminine uh, physiologies in order to become these asexual beings, right? That, are, that cannot reproduce themselves. Um, and so it masquerades around a, a different type of veneer in the secular age, but it's ultimately still coming from the same place. Uh, I don't believe personally, I think in my view, I don't believe that there are supernatural, uh, super, supernatural forces at play, um, demonically from another dimension or anything like that. In, in this, my view of history, I, I personally see it as though they really believe there are, and they will do everything possible to manifest a lot of this stuff, including their work on like. <laughs> like you've seen the the, the uh, CERN, the CERN uh, particle accelerator uh, inauguration in in Switzerland. Mm-mm. It's it's creepy as sin. Um, it was recently inaugurated this giant particle accelerator where they're hoping to explore how particles can explode when when accelerated okay. fast enough, and then explore like string theory, you know, quantum gravitation, uh, other universes that they think well that exist according to their mathematical equations. There's no actual evidence that there are other universes except the one that we live in. But according to the mathematics that they have been pushing, you can you can justify anything. You could justify 30 dimensions. You could justify a thousand dimensions. Like that's part of the whole like attack on truth. Because in math, you could just justify mm-hmm. everything. And if everything is true, nothing is true. That's why they're also pushing it in in like comic book uh, movies and stuff, like the multiverse and things like that, to just normalize this idea that you know <laughs> there. In other universes, their gravity may may work, you know, the opposite of ours. So thus, gravity yeah. is not really true. It's just kind of subjectively true in our universe, but it's not really true. Right. So anyway, um, no. So I, yeah, in my my assessment, I think that they're uh, they're nuts. <laughs> they're religiously committed to this uh, religious view of uh, invoking satanic uh, powers, but I think ultimately, I don't I don't think that they're actually doing it. I think that they're just trying to. I want to tell you about something really cool because I know a lot of you guys are worried about the economy, where things are going, the value of the dollar, inflation, all of these things, local government, state government, national government, all becoming too tyrannical. I'm going to tell you about the Expat Money Summit and it's upcoming online summit by my friend, you've heard him on the show, Mikhail Thorup from expatmoney.com with over 30 experts who are focused on moving your life, business and wealth offshore and the best part of all of this i mean these guys know all of these things about money why aren't they charging for this are they crazy well they're not charging for it they're not crazy they're here to help you it's free to attend it's over at expatmoneysummit.com you can reclaim your freedom from chaos and uncertainty and there's a lot of chaos and uncertainty out there we all know that the topics at this money summit will include how to secure your own plan b safe haven how to use foreign currencies, offshore banking, and decentralized finance to safeguard your money, how to legally reduce your tax burden, legally that is, how and where to safely store gold, silver, and other precious metals, where the best countries are in the world to find freedom for yourself and your family, how you can get a second passport to travel the globe without restrictions and get in and out of different countries' borders. You will also learn about a libertarian island haven, private cities, communities on the ocean, wow, and food and energy independent towns in Latin America. You can register now for free over at expatmoneysummit.com. This is your way to fight back against what is happening in the world. Stand up, protect yourself, and find out how to secure your new life abroad. Again, you can register for free over at expatmoneysummit.com. Let's get back to the show. You mentioned earlier that you think, I, I call it the new right, uh, the the America first right, the anti-neocon right. Uh, it certainly flourished on, under after 2016, certainly. Uh, you said uh, that those guys might be, and girls might be the only way to to stop a lot of this 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 stuff <laughs> these plans that are seemingly moving forward especially under Biden uh, 
do you see something like that? Do you, are you optimists? Uh, are you an optimist when it comes to that? Do you see a red wave coming for the U.S. in 2022, 2024? What are your thoughts on the ne- in the, for the next few years here uh, with this whole scenario? Well, I, I am enlivened by the the fact that the the better Republican movement hasn't given up, but is con- is reorganizing itself and is is continuously fighting. I, I listen to NPR and stupid radio channels just to hear what uh, what kind of brainwashing is being put out there. And uh, there's enough. There are enough liberal freaks who are melting down, having conniption fits over the fact that Trump approved candidates are uh, gaining positions of of very high influence, which they only see. I mean going higher. They, they're, they're going into war mode now out of fear um, of this phenomenon, because in their minds, they, sh- they thought that the Republican Party would have been purged of all of the Trump influence at this point. And they're like startled yeah. by the fact that they're still, it's still moving. <laughs> um, and I give a lot of interviews as well um, with various, um, you know, people like yourself, just conservative, moral Americans um, on, a, on a daily basis. And uh, I got to say, the the level of passion is very high. The level of humility and wisdom is very high. There's a lot of fear as well, obviously, because the U.S. has federally, uh, it's been taken over. Um, that's, yeah. that's a scary thing. So the, I do see in various states, like in the U.S., in uh, Texas recently, about four, three or four weeks ago, the Republican uh, convention occurred and they unanimously adopted a policy that I think is super important, which is the... Uh, a policy for a, a, a national bank. Um, mm-hmm. That is super important. If you're going to be able to fight this international private financier oligarchy, you have to have a restoration of a nationally controlled uh, banking system like what was done under Lincoln with the greenbacks. Um, although it wasn't finalized, Lincoln was killed before it could really be consolidated. Um, but um, that that's something. So I think that you need to have a bit more... Um, leadership that could bring coherence to the many diverse Republican factions that are sort of fighting locally in different states and bring a broader strategic viable coherence uh, to the the movement that is in harmony with a battle that I already see happening. Like the whether, whether Americans know this or not, whether they're looking at it or not, there is, like I said at the beginning of our interview, a, an actual fight over the, the future of humankind currently and the champions of humanity currently, <laughs> whether people like it or not, are found in Eurasia. That's where the battle is currently being like waged. And there's a lot of psyops in our uh, media, even alternative media, to try to convince us that that's not only not happening, but that if anything, Britain is not a causal agent in any of our misfortune, but it's rather uh, China is the big ultimate baddie of the world you have to be afraid of. They want to destroy uh, our Western values, and it's all them. And uh, there's a lot of, again, reframing, narrative, narrative manipulation and ignoring of vital context in order to amplify this belief, in order to, I think, render a lot of moral people uh, handicapped from the weapons that they need to utilize in order to properly carry out their fight, which they need to do. And I think that Trump was even doing this when you, in a good way. When you, when you look into uh, May, May 2019, he was already giving speeches with the vice uh, vice premier of China in the Oval Office, which bypassed the State Department or the deep state department, is, yeah. as it has been called. And he basically said, yeah. you know, instead of build, putting billions of dollars into nuclear weapons and killing each other, how about Russia, China and the US? He named those three. Redirect those, that money in towards building building infrastructure for everybody's benefit for the world. And uh, that was explosive. He, he restated that message in several other speeches. Um, but that really flipped out the roundtable movement, the Council on Foreign Relations operations inside of the United States, which is sort of the British hand. They flipped out all of their, their talking heads, the Atlantic Council, NATO freaks. They all like had conniption fits around this fact. And that was at the heart of Trump's, not only his Arctic development orientation to build the rail line into Alaska, uh, which would have completely yeah. transformed the, the Arctic into a domain of cooperation a lot of resources there. It could have also, it's the renewal for Canada too. Our salvation is in developing the Arctic instead of, instead of building miss, a missile shield there, which is currently the, the Biden Trudeau orientation is put missiles pointed at Russia from the Arctic <laughs> and Alaska. Let's instead work with Ala- uh, Russia, who's already doing this on building rail, developing those resources as friends. And, uh, and with China, the idea was, uh, you know, Trump's US-China trade deal. 
was a key part of rehabilitating the uh, U.S. Rust Belt, Detroit and Philadelphia and other other mm-hmm. the U.S. that had been shut down. China was going to buy three hundred and fifty billion dollars of finished goods, and that was disrupted by COVID. So, mm, mm-hmm. yeah, you have to get back to that type of, of strategy. That's a that's an orientation that can work, though. What inherent flaws do you see in libertarianism? I think that there's an over um, simplification of the corruption of the state. Um, I think the state is corrupt to the degree that it falls under the influence of a of a financier oligarchy, which has always always been since the days of ancient Babylon. There's been an inner elite core of of families maintaining cults, maintaining a certain methodology of keeping society locked in a, you know, to use Plato's allegory of the cave. The idea has been. Um, a science of getting us to believe that our identity and potential was is located purely in the belief in our senses, the five senses we were born with. Um, the reality is that we, when we're mature, learn to see with our mind's eye, which is not just logic, it's also a, a mind guided by compassion, right, by the heart. So they work together. Mm-hmm. And uh, and that's, I mean, the, the, the health or sickness of our soul is contingent upon the decisions that I think we make to, to live by wisdom to see with the mind's eye and and to live for others and out of love or to do the opposite and live for selfishness um that usually brings us into folly and thus evil um so there's there's a sort of science of evil of of making inducing people to be the worst that they can possibly be and thus more easily controlled and corralled as a herd rather than sovereign individuals who stand and think for themselves which is the, which is the precondition for a sovereign nation state is you have to have sovereign citizens who can all think for themselves instead of just going with what the herd thinks. Um, and that's mm-hmm. why you need to have We're in them. trouble, then. Huh? <laughs> We're in trouble. We're, <laughs> We're in trouble. We've fallen far, man. But, but all that to say, um, I think that um, the... Uh, hold on one second. Let me just recapture my... Uh, I, 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 I got demoralized right thinking about how... <laughs> How dumbed down the system, uh, but but despite that, no, we we do have to cultivate this ability to think in terms of wisdom. Remind me your question again, just so I can wrap it up. Just the the, the inherent flaws in libertarianism. Oh, okay, right. So yeah, I think that the in the libertarian Austrian school uh, mindset, one of the assumptions is that the state is inherently corrupt. Anytime you have national sovereign influence over the economic direction of a society, it's always bad. What so whether you're talking about Abraham Lincoln or Franklin Roosevelt or Mussolini or Hitler, it's all, they all use the nation state powers to do things and thus they're all bad. Um, whereas what I'm, I'm in my assessment, I think that the nation state may or may not be bad depending upon the level of cultural wisdom or folly as w- that will then be reflected in all echelons of power from the, the federal down to the, the bottom and, and vice, vice versa. Um, so I don't think that the state is intrinsically bad. I think it could be, uh, and, and it is, I think, uh, as it grew out of the golden renaissance, one of the most powerful instruments of defense of the people against this oligarchy, which is why they want to destroy the nation state and create a one world post nation state order. You know, it, it, they don't. So in that sense, they, they only like the nation state to the degree that they control it to enslave us. And then it's not really the nation state anymore. It's just another tool of empire. Yeah. Um, and uh, the other thing too, I think, the second thing I would say that in, and not all libertarians believe this, you know, but there's, there's a tendency to think of the, the source of value located in everybody's hedonistic desires to satisfy their pleasure and avoid pain. Um, I don't think that that's true because there's a lot of personal pleasures, which actually cause, uh, destruction to our soul or harm to the broader society like heroin, you know, or whatever. So Um, I think that in that sense, there's only those pleasures that are the pleasures of the soul are inherently good, but that there's not every pleasure of the flesh is equally good. In fact, most of the pleasures of the flesh cause pain (laughs) if you, uh, allow them to go unchecked. And, and so there's that problem that tends to be a, I don't see, there's a lot of good libertarians who are just mature people who don't think that. I think Lou Rockwell is a great example of somebody who's just a very mature thinker. He just, he has a very positive idea of human nature. Um, that's not shared by a lot of the Austrian school thinkers. So. All right. Uh, it's time for you to plug anything you'd like, web presence, social media presence, mm. products, content, anything you'd like, Matt. 
Yeah, well, I guess I'll just recap uh, what I said at the beginning. My book series, uh, here, I got a, got a copy of the last book right now. It's out. Um, so this is what my wife and I just co-wrote, uh, The Birth of the Eurasian Manifest Destiny. Ben Franklin there and the uh, the, the New Silk Road um, design behind Ben Franklin. This is part three of three, um, 400 pages. So people can get that off the CanadianPatriot.org, O-R-G website. And uh, my sub stack is my bread and butter. So if people want to subscribe to my Substack, that, you know, I put out material usually every day, um, video and written material. Um, that's always pretty, pretty useful. And otherwise, if they ju- just want to keep track of the writings, um, I maintain the CanadianPatriot.org website and the RisingTideFoundation.net, um, which just has a lot of good mind food to chew on. That's, that's pretty much. Oh, and if you can't afford the books, by the way, for people listening, and if you're like, okay, the economy's tr- kicked my ass, I can't afford uh, to buy books right now. Um, just send me an email. I can send you a free PDF at info at rising tide foundation.net. And, uh, just ask for whatever books you want. Uh, I'll send you the PDFs. Excellent. That's really cool. I'm going to link to all of this in the show notes page, awesome. uh, for this ep- episode and real quick prediction. And for the United States in 2024, who represents the Republican party for president? Hope it's, I, I, I still hope it's Trump. I hope he, I hope he does it. There's a few others who, who right. maybe might might have some viability, but right now the the person who I see as the most uh, willing instrument to fight, um, who's out there, who's who's got a certain like capability that I've seen despite his blind spots, and I know there's blind spots, but regardless, um, is Trump. So from a practical fighting standpoint, that's what I'm I'm hoping for. Awesome. All right, Matt Eret, thank you so much for being here on Counterflow. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. All right, I hope you guys enjoyed that chat with Matthew. Eric, and uh, of course, I mention this a lot. If you'd like to support this show, you can go to patreon.com slash counterflow and donate there. It's a monthly deal. You can give as little as a dollar or as much as you want, really. And I always tell you this as well. Every penny I earn through Patreon goes right back into this show. And I'm truly grateful. And of course, I'll reach out and, and write you an email once this all happens. If you'd like to donate there, Of course, also the YouTube page, you can see this video today, my chat with Matthew Arrett and see all of the the books he's got behind him. Of course, you knew he was smart, but you'll know for sure when you see all of those books, right? That's how people do it. Yeah, go to YouTube, search Counterflow with Buck Johnson, subscribe to the channel and you can get uh, the podcast that way as well. I've been talking with people. I don't want to spoil the surprise, but I think there's going to be a big a live streaming thing on there pretty soon. A live stream, Counterflow live stream with several guests. But again, until it's firm, the plans are concrete and for sure going to happen. I don't want to mess anything up. So you can see that all over at the YouTube page. We got a Telegram group, of course. And all of this can be found at counterflowpodcast.com. Thank you guys for your support. Thanks for always reaching out and shooting me messages and nice things to say and and maybe not so nice sometimes but either way i appreciate the feedback and i will talk to you guys soon have a good one you get split in fucking half cause i call him the hologram brass but i am the center inside the placenta of math you clash with cyanide gas and die fast rhythmical equivalent of solids liquid and gas we smash a science with the power of lord titus but i am the virus inside of the iris of cyrus like the sound of the counterflow podcast our audio production is provided by podsworth media Check them out at podsworth.com.